Anybody who sees Zenith here gasps in awe at his beauty, and rightly so. But beyond the obvious, what makes these snakes so special? And why and how did I have to create my own care guide for him? Should you do the same for your snake? Let's slither on into it to find out. There are two subspecies of the Madagascar or Malagasy tree boa, classified under the genus Sanzinia. Each of these two species is primarily endemic to the east or west side of the country, respectively, and are recognizable by their chunky, diamond-shaped heads, distinctive faces with these weird and, I think, adorable, mustache of pits around their mouths, and their beautiful patterns. But they do have significant differences from each other. On the eastern side, you have Sanzinia madagascariensis, which has a green base color beneath its pattern. And on the western side, you have Sanzinia voluntani, which has the reddish brown background as you see here in Zenith. Both subspecies go through an ontogenetic color change. So this bright background color usually dulls down quite a bit as they age especially in gravid females, who often turn almost black during their pregnancy. However, I have noticed that in some captive bred lines, selective breeding has allowed some folks to produce animals that retain more of their color as adults. Most likely, these reddish brown will darken quite a bit, but according to the breeder I got him from, the higher the yellow and the contrast that they have as babies, the more likely they are to keep that yellow in contrast as adults. As you can see, Z has quite a bit of high yellow patterns and I chose him partially because his black markings were so distinct, as opposed to some of his siblings who had black speckling rather than these beautiful tiger stripes he has. Side note, I've always wondered about why some species of snakes are more colorful as babies than they are as adults. I mean, being more brightly colored means they'd stand out and be more visible to predators who could easily chomp up a baby snake. I have a theory on this, though I have no proof to back it up. So if you know if there's a scientifically documented reason for this, please let me know in the comments. But I've speculated that their vibrant colors might make them seem like dangerous prey items since many poisonous and venomous creatures are brightly colored as nature's little warning sign. These are non-venomous snakes though, just like all other species in the Voidae family. Their common name is a bit misleading because although they're called tree boas and are definitely quite arboreal, especially as babies, they do actually split their time pretty evenly between the ground and the trees. Stranger still, Sanzinia voluntani has another common name, the Nosicomba ground boa. Come on, people. <laughs> you might as well call them Madagascar up and down boas. The nosy part of that name probably refers to the fact that this species is found frequently in the tiny islands off the western coast of Madagascar called Nosy Bay and Nosy Comba. Eastern Madagascar is a bit more lush with forest, while the western side has some areas of drier, more arid climates. But in general, both Sanzinias are found in the humid, foresty regions of the country. Sanzinias are not common in the pet trade. There are a limited number of people breeding them in captivity. Zenith is capped bred, meaning that he was not taken from the wild in Madagascar, and I'd always recommend buying captive bred over wild-caught animals for many reasons, but being rare in the pet trade is probably why, one, they are extremely expensive, and two, when I was preparing to get him and I looked online for care guides, I could find none specific to Sanzinia voluntani, only for Sanzinia madagascariensis. This is an important topic to discuss because although most pet snakes are easy to find care guides for online, many of them have contradictory information or are even straight up wrong. And how do you know what to trust or what happens when one just doesn't exist for the animal you got? You can't just wing it. So knowing how to do some research on the species is really important in order to ensure the animal thrives in captive care. 
Of course, the first step is always to talk to the breeder about it because, well, if they're breeding them, you can't assume they know something about how to keep them healthy, right? But just because someone has gotten the snakes to breed in captivity does not mean that they're keeping them in a way that's aligned with their natural habitat. Breeding is just part of the animal's survival, and surviving does not equal thriving. An easy next step would be to reach out to other people who keep them. So in this case, I contacted someone else who was showing theirs off on Instagram and asked if they had any tips, but I wasn't really satisfied with that either. After watching Dave Kaufman's episode about Dumeril's boas and discovering that the care sheets I'd found for that species were not accurate based on his findings, I decided I didn't want to leave anything up to chance with Zenith. So I attended a webinar called Researching Your Reptile. This provided me with some great tools to gain more accurate knowledge about Zenith's native habitat so I could provide environmental parameters that more closely matched what he would normally experience in the wild. Now, I'm not saying my husbandry is a perfect replica of Madagascar, but these methods enabled me to have a more scientific understanding of what he needs. Just because the animal can survive in different conditions doesn't mean it's what's best for their overall health, well-being, and longevity. And I want this guy to live a long and happy life with me. So I signed up for a free account on iNaturalist.com and looked up his species to find out where people had documented finding them in the wild. This is pretty cool, because although these are called Western Madagascar tree boas, I saw that they really had quite a range across the country. The next step was to take the names of the closest town or city to the sightings and enter those into weatherspark.com, which gives you a pretty comprehensive amount of temperature, humidity, and day and night cycle data to reference. It shows you changes in temps and humidity for each month of the year, and since these animals are pretty spread out across the island, I use several of these as reference points to find an average between them. I could use these hours of daylight and twilight charts to set his light cycle appropriately as well. As you can see, even though Sanzania Volantani live in some drier areas of Madagascar, the country is a pretty muggy place in general. And these charts are based on cities, which are gonna be drier than the forests the snakes actually live in. So if you're gonna keep them, make sure to note that they thrive at quite a high level of humidity for all but a few months out of the year. Although it's usually best to keep baby snakes in smaller enclosures so they feel more secure, I decided to try out giving him a 36 by 18 by 24 enclosure right away, making sure to fill it with lots of branches, plant cover, and hiding places. I watched him carefully and made sure that he wasn't showing signs of stress, like refusing food, and he seemed to adapt quite nicely to it without issue. Remember, each animal is an individual. There isn't just one way to keep snakes. The crucial part is on you. Pay attention and they'll tell you whether what you're doing is working for them. These guys average five to seven feet as adults with females getting much bigger than males. So if you're gonna get one, make sure to plan accordingly and prepare to end up with an enclosure that's at least as long as they are and with some extra height on it so they can climb and decent depth on the ground because despite their name, they are not strictly arboreal snakes. Some of the things I read online about them said that being nocturnal, they spend their days in the trees hiding and their nights on the forest floor hunting. And yeah, when I first got Z, his daytime sleeping spot was way up in this quite awkward place. However, after the first few weeks, he stopped doing that entirely and his favorite place to sleep the day away is on the ground under a particular piece of cork bark that he likes. At night, this guy is all over the place. The branches, the ground, everywhere. And usually he assumes his hunting position from the branches. So once again, I'm glad I did research and spent time observing him instead of strictly going off of somebody's website. So what else makes Sanzania such an incredible and therapeutic snake to keep? I mean, besides, obviously, how could you not feel good just admiring their beauty? But beyond that, as you can see, these guys are chill. 
According to all accounts and my own experience, they're pretty much always this way. They move slowly and deliberately, unless it's daytime, of course, when they're sleepy and barely move at all. And in general, they're calm, gentle, and curious. And this makes them a really lovely snake to handle. I find myself grinning from ear to ear every time I take him out. Of course, like all snakes, they can be defensive as babies, but unlike baby colubrids like king or rat snakes, they're not going to be spazzy little shoestring-sized lightning bolts trying to squirm away or rattling their tails and snapping. They just might do a cute little defensive bluff strike when you go into their enclosure before they really know that you're not a scary monster coming to eat them. Zenith did that twice in the first weeks I had him, though he never made contact and if he had, I doubt I would have felt anything. But now that we've established trust, he's never done it again. I do watch his body language when I go to take him out at nighttime, and hook training has helped him learn when I'm planning on picking him up and has helped reduce his stress when I open his enclosure. I've also been drop feeding him on a particular plastic Tupperware top, essentially employing a very lazy type of target training. Drop feeding just means that instead of using tongs to present him with his food and getting him to strike it, I put the prey item on this blue circle top and leave it for him. So now he associates that blue circle with food and not my hand. This was a dream species of mine for a while, and they're not common to have as a pet, but they're absolutely a delight if you can manage to score one. I feel pretty lucky this guy came into my life, and I absolutely adore him. Thank you. <laughs> Won't you come out to play, dear Prudence? Drink the red I'll put links in the description to a breeder or two that might have them if you're interested. And hopefully sharing my experience of researching his care can help you provide better care for your animals, whether it's a Sanzinia or any other exotic species. If it did help you at all, make sure to give the video a like and let me know in the comments if you've got a Sanzinia and have any tips on keeping them that I didn't mention. I'm Shira and this is Zenith. And we'll see you next time for more snake therapy. Oh.